Center for States is pleased to welcome you to the first Child Welfare Virtual Expo focused on building capacity to address sex traffic and normalcy. My name is Elizabeth Eaton and I am with the Capacity Building Center for States. I'm going to go over just a few housekeeping items and provide a brief overview of the virtual platform. If you are reading the closed captioning but not hearing me, try turning up the external speakers on your computer or your device. As you logged in, and enter the virtual expo space, you may have noticed that there are several areas for you to visit during the day. They're accessible through the top navigation bar or from the main home, our conference lobby. You'll see that we have access to the conference sessions, the exhibit hall, the resource center, the lounge, your My Profile, and the help desk. We hope you will take full advantage of each of these areas during the day. Because you are watching me now, we know that you have made it to the auditorium. This is where the six featured vi video presentations will take place today. From here, you can access information on each session and the presenters. Please keep in mind that we're accessible on the go, so feel free to take us with you throughout the day and access the conference on your tablet or cell phone. If you have not already done so, we encourage you to set up your profile by clicking on the My Profile tab. This will take only a few minutes and you can add a picture and some information about yourself. This will help set up your virtual business card or V card that you can share with other participants during the virtual expo. This is also where you can access your virtual briefcase. You can save and include resources accessible throughout the day that you can download after the virtual expo. To assist with questions about the platform or setting up your profile, we've also provided you access to a navigation guide that you can access through the help desk. Additionally, you can access the help desk anytime by clicking on help at the top of your screen. In the current view, you will notice that there are several windows that you can move around. You can make them smaller or larger by using the navigation at the top right corner of each box. In addition, there are many features on the platform to make the expo more dynamic. We encourage you to provide comments in the chat window found on the bottom of your screen or ask questions of presenters in the Q&A box. We'll also be posting messages and announcements throughout the day through a scrolling feature. Before I turn it over to Rosie Gomez, I also wanted to mention that we will present evaluations at the end of each session, and your feedback is very important to us. Also, CEUs are available for the five sessions that follow today's opening. To purchase CEUs, please visit the Resource Center and click on the tab CEU Information. Now, I will turn it over to Rosie Gomez, Senior Policy Advisor on Trafficking Prevention at the, at the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families. Ms. Gomez aligns anti-trafficking initiatives across ACYF and partners with the federal agencies and other entities to create and enhance programs and activities related to trafficking. Good morning, and welcome to the Child Welfare Building Capacity Center uh, Expo on Addressing Sex Trafficking and Normalcy. My name is Rosie Gomez and as Elizabeth noted, I'm a Senior Policy Advisor on Trafficking Prevention at the Administration on Children, Youth and Families. And I'd like to welcome you all to this important event today. This is the first, first virtual convening of child welfare agencies, courts and tribes to address critical child welfare issues. Signed into law in September of 2014, the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act, or Public Law 113-183, amended the Title IV-E Foster Care Program and presented new child welfare requirements on provisions related to sex trafficking, normalcy, and permanency. Many of you have been involved in the work of these key provisions over the last year. Today's expo presentations will offer an exciting forum for sharing information about what we know and 
building connections to help you tackle the complexities of sex trafficking and normalcy. But before we begin our first session, I'd like to invite Maggie Bishop, who's the Executive Director of the Building Capacity Center for States, to provide some opening remarks. And she and her team were really instrumental in the planning of this expo. Thank you, Rosie. On behalf of the Capacity Building Center for States and the Capacity Building Collaborative, I want to welcome you to the virtual expo. We are excited to be able to tap into today's technology to bring together audiences from across the country and to dig into the complex issues of responding to sex trafficking and promoting normalcy. This virtual expo is a great example of the work we do at the Center for States and across the Collaborative, which includes our partner centers, the Center for Tribes and the Center for Courts. The Collaborative is designed to help public child welfare agencies, tribes, and courts to enhance and mobilize human and organizational assets in order to improve child welfare practice and administration and to achieve safety, permanency, and well-being for children, youth, and families. The Collaborative's capacity building services advance your potential to be productive and effective, and we do this in several ways. We help build awareness, knowledge, and skills through products, learning experiences, and events. We foster relationships and build networks to provide opportunities to learn from each other's successes and lessons learned. And we work closely with states, territories, tribes, and court improvement programs to assess specific needs and challenges and then deliver services to address those needs. This expo continues the work the Children's Bureau and the Collaborative began more than a year ago to support the states, tribes, and courts in meeting the mandates of PL113183 through guidance, best practice information, and capacity building. Today is a demonstration of our efforts to blend innovation with capacity building. We're breaking, down, we're breaking new ground with the use of conference technology. We know the importance of conferences as a means to exchange ideas about best practices and effective approaches. We're thrilled to have representatives from states, county, and private child welfare agencies, tribes, court systems, and others who support our work with children and families. We are particularly glad to hear about those of you who have joined together with colleagues in conference rooms to approach this as a collaborative learning experience. By leveraging technology and innovation, today's expo has been designed to accomplish four objectives. The first is to raise awareness, particularly as we listen to the powerful messages of trafficking survivors. The second objective is to build knowledge and skills, to provide access to resources and tools and the, these include from the Center for States, learning experiences on sex trafficking, a data snapshot on youth who run away from foster care, which explores what we, what we can learn from data, a guide to having normalcy conversations, and authentic voices videos. You can learn more about these and other relevant resources during the day at the Center for States Virtual Expo booth or after the expo at the Collaborative's website. And our final objective is to promote connections. Despite our different geographical locations, we are committed to using this venue to bring together today um, people from across the country and to promote networking. We encourage you to take advantage of the opportunities to chat, to email, and make connections with subject matter experts and colleagues, and to join us in sharing your experiences on Twitter. We've worked to make this experience engaging and interactive. We encourage your active listening and participation. In closing, I hope today offers you an innovative opportunity to learn and engage around complex topics and that the Expo provides new insights into what we know is important yet challenging work. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to welcome you this morning. And now I'll turn it back over to Rosie Gomez. Well, thank you. And now we want to start our first panel on really bridging the different topics of sex trafficking and normalcy. So I want to introduce our panel members. First, we have Lauren Devine. She is a child protection specialist with the Office on Trafficking in Persons within the Administration for Children and Families. Second, we have Anna Cody, and she's the human trafficking specialist at the Family and Youth Services Bureau within the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families. And she ensures that runaway and homeless youth programs are identifying and providing quality services to youth who are at risk for who are victims of human trafficking. And lastly, we have a Maggie Bishop, who you just heard from, who is the director of the Capacity Building Center for States. So thank you all for joining. 
And during this segment, we will ask our panel questions about how to bring forward important points related to the prevention of sex trafficking, how we promote normalcy, and any available resources. But before we begin the presentation, I just want to remind the audience that there is a chat feature where you can um, insert questions, and if we have time at the end of the panel, we will try, try to answer some of those questions. So let's get started. Um, for you, Lauren, I know that OTIP is a fairly new office. It was established last year. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us a little bit about the programs and activities that OTIP leads? Yes. Thanks so much, Rosie. Um, yes, the Administration for Children and Families established the Office on Trafficking in Persons, or OTIP, um, in June of 2015 with the mission of combating human trafficking by supporting and leading systems that prevent trafficking through public awareness and protect victims through identification and assistance. In terms of prevention of sex trafficking, our office recognizes that human trafficking is not only a violent crime, but is also a public health issue, meaning that to prevent trafficking from a public health approach, we must identify root causes to increase prevention, collaborate with stakeholders at all levels to strengthen systems and structures, as well as empower service providers and communities to provide a safe space for youth to come forward with their experiences. Therefore, OTIP supports the HHS Task Force to Prevent and End Human Trafficking, raises awareness about human trafficking through the Look Beneath the Surface campaign, partners with the Department of Education to reach youth and educators, and collaborates with various partners at ACF to address human trafficking from a public health approach. While OTIP collaborates with many of the agencies you will hear from today to support the prevention of sex trafficking, I want to focus on the way in which OTIP supports prevention efforts for foreign national minors who are victims of trafficking, specifically through identification and assistance, which in turn can help to prevent further victimization. In my role as a child protection specialist, I review cases of potential trafficking for foreign national minors that are currently in the United States. We receive these cases from clinicians, case managers, law enforcement, advocates, attorneys, and others who are working with minors. In the cases we review, the minors could have experienced trafficking in their home country, along their journey, or here in the United States at any point in their lives. Therefore, if a minor you are working with discloses a case of potential trafficking that occurred five years ago in their home country, that information should be reported. After review of the trafficking concerns for the minor, we are guided by the TVBA to issue interim assistance and eligibility letters, which allow for a foreign national minor who is determined to be a victim of trafficking to be eligible for benefits and services to the same extent as a refugee. These services can include TANF, refugee cash assistance, Medicaid, in some cases ORR funded foster care, case management services, SNAP, and housing. As I previously mentioned, while the, while the prevention of sex trafficking is a multi-dimensional effort through many systems and structures, effective and timely identification and reporting is a part of that effort. The TVPA mandates that federal, state, and local officials notify HHS within 24 hours of discovering a foreign national minor who may be a victim of trafficking. Therefore, if you're working with a foreign national minor who reports any concerns related to sex or labor trafficking, notify us by emailing childtrafficking at acf.hhs.gov or by calling our child trafficking line at 202-205-4582. With the passing of the JVTA, trafficking is now a part of the federal definition of child abuse and should be reported appropriately. If submitting a case of potential tra trafficking to us, the request for assistance form that should be filled out to make the referral can be found in your resources as well as on our website. Along with reporting, if you have any questions related to this process for foreign national minors or just want to staff a case, please contact us at any point. Great, thank you, Lauren. And I know OTIP also has a newsletter, and you can um, find their information online. Yeah. And Anna, what about the Family Youth Services Bureau? Can you tell us a little bit about how they are working to address uh, the issue of trafficking? Sure. Um, first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about the mission of Family and Youth Services Bureau, or FISB, how we call it. And really, our work is our mission and values are to support um, organizations and communities that are working to put an end to youth, youth homelessness, homelessness, adolescent pregnancy, and domestic violence. And to address those issues and to achieve this goal, we do it through different programs uh, within FISB. And I really wanted to um, discuss uh, one of the programs specifically today, which is the Runaway and Homeless Youth Program. They, um, 
and this FISB, we uh, run 600 programs uh, through 300 grant trees across the country. And the um, runaway and homeless youth program includes three major programs. Uh, the first one is the Street Outreach Program, or SOP, uh, the Basic Center Program. We also have the Transitional Living Program and Maternity Group Homes. And I just want to also mention that uh, when we talk about runaway and homeless youth programs, we think about just shelter and housing, but I just want to make sure that uh, we know that we are more than that, that we do provide a, a huge spectrum of services to ensure positive youth outcome by either promoting self-sufficiency, mm -hmm. uh, we provide, uh, we include youth engagement, community engagement through our programs, and do provide case management services to meet long-term uh, goals uh, with this youth. And lately, I believe in the last couple years, we are putting a lot of efforts on uh, human trafficking, both uh, sex and labor trafficking, to really increase the capacity of our programs to prevent, identify, mm -hmm. and provide services to you who are at risk um, and, or who are victim of uh, human trafficking within our programs. And to do that, we have expanded tremendously our um, collaboration effort across uh, federal agencies, across ACF, uh, also at the local level, mm -hmm. working with child, well, um, child welfare agencies, a very, very being creative about bringing new approaches to provide uh, normalcy uh, through the activity and support the work, because this really the, um, the youth that we serve, they're, uh, they are the youth in our communities. So. Great, thank you, Anna. And I just want to remind the audience that the Children's Bureau also works very closely with OTIP and the Family and Youth Services Bureau. And we have many programs and activities that address human trafficking. One I'd like to mention is our grant program that is in nine different states across the nation. It's grants to address trafficking within the child welfare population. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of these grants is to build child welfare's response to human trafficking through a multi-system approach. So they work with many different partners, including juvenile justice, um, child welfare agencies, courts, runaway and homeless youth programs, uh, survivor aid advocacy organizations, and many other service partners. The other item that I wanted to mention is that we have our Child Welfare Information Gateway. And on that website, we have many resources related to the issue of human trafficking. We have a new web page on there that has information related to ACYF programs and activities. So let's talk a little bit more about the complexities of sex trafficking and normalcy. So Lauren, can you tell us from your perspective some of the complexities related to sex trafficking? Yes. Um, so in reviewing cases of potential sex trafficking for foreign national minors, um, we see a variety of barriers and complexities um, that impact disclosure and, and identification especially. Um, the complexities that we most often come across are when minors are not aware they're victims, um, when minors are experiencing complex trauma and or bonds to the trafficker, when the traffickers coach the minor to respond in a specific way and therefore the minor doesn't self-identify, um, when the minor has a fear of authorities, which can also include their clinicians and, and service providers, um, and also when the minor may not even understand human trafficking and therefore will not disclose. Um, so as a service provider, something that's important to be aware of in, in regards to sex trafficking is that a minor is considered a victim of sex trafficking when a minor con is considered a victim of sex trafficking when there's credible evidence that the minor was induced to perform a commercial sex act. So unlike an adult, for a minor, force, fraud, or coercion do not need to be present for a minor to be considered a victim. Furthermore, since force, fraud, or coercion do not need to be present, if a minor discloses you that they discloses to you that they willingly engage in a sex act, whether with a stranger or their partner, the minor's disclosure should be a precursor for further follow-up and assessment for potential trafficking. These questions should be ar around whether the minor felt that something of value was exchanged for the sex act, etc. Mm -hmm. As mentioned, because the minor themselves may not view themselves as a victim, if they are reporting to you that they willingly engaged, this can be a barrier for identification and disclosure and is helpful to be aware of as a service provider when meeting with a minor. Also, along with the recent changes to the definition of sex trafficking in the passing of the JBTA, the inclusion of soliciting and patronizing, if the minor was induced to perform a commercial sex act, even if the sex act did not occur, 
for reasons such as the minor escaping the situation, the minor refusing to engage in the sex act, law enforcement intervening, or, and others, it's still important to report that information as potential trafficking. In, fisc in fiscal year 2015, we issued 186 eligibility letters to foreign national minors that were victims of labor trafficking, and then 46 eligibility letters to foreign national minors that were victims of sex trafficking. However, we also issued eight letters for foreign national minors that were victims of both labor and sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. So with this, it's important to be cognizant of the intersection between sex trafficking in the framework of other exploitations, such as forced labor or labor trafficking, child abuse, and sexual assault, and therefore ensuring to assess for potential sex trafficking indicators when other types of exploitations and abuses are disclosed by the minors. Great, thank you. Yeah. And Anna, with the Family Youth Services Bureau um, and the programs that you're leading, how, what do you see with the complexities of that population? Well, we, uh, through uh, the runaway on the youth program, probably we see, and through domestic violence, we also see where we're talking about minors and youth, um, runaway home and youth programs have been working in identifying and providing services to youth who are victims of trafficking for a very long time. But in the last couple of years, in 2013 and 14, FISB conducted an assessment to our program to kind of uh, figure it out what we, what they are the programs are seeing in the field, what is the uh, gaps and what we need mm -hmm. to provide to, for them to build the capacity. So through this assessment, we find out that we have been seeing all type of trafficking from mm -hmm. pimp control, family control, gang control, and of course, um, survival sex, which is, you know, uh, where youth are forced to trade uh, sex for anything to relate to shelter, protection, and food. Um, so we also, uh, we kind of verify this information Last year, with the release of the street outreach um, uh, program study, which uh, <clears throat> we conducted in uh, through eleven um, in eleven cities, and uh, we through this uh, study we kind of uh, kind of confirm that uh, survival sex and and, and those uh, perpetrators trying to um, take advantage of the vulnerability of the of the youth. Uh, has been increasing. We saw a um, 36 percent increase mm -hmm. um, on this type of situation where youth were forced to trade sex for uh, food uh, protection or a shelter. We also we find out through this study that um, <clears throat> they were uh, forced to this to this activity just when they become homeless. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. a stable housing is a very important factor to avoid and minimize the risk of recruitment and sex trafficking when it comes to runaway and homeless youth. We also find out that eight out of 10 youth who were, um, they had to uh, trade sex um, for exchange of money or something else, they were able to, eight out of 10, they were allowed to keep their money. So we kind of figured out that even though they don't identify a trafficker or a pimp, there is someone there that is forcing this type of situation and they cannot, they don't want to be identified. Um, so we also know an increase in LGBTQ uh, youth who are either running away or becoming homeless experiences a lot of uh, sexual victimization. And um, we are really increasing the capacity of our programs to really provide cultural appropriate services to these youth. And also we, we um, we kind of understood that uh, traffickers are not use, are really using or capitalizing or runaway on the use vulnerabilities because they're not using only for um, sex trafficking or any type of sexual victimization, but they are using to recruit other youth. Mm -hmm. So that was a very important point for us to really increase the capacity to um, make our programs uh, uh, provide more tools for them to deal with this type of situation and recognize that when youth are recruiting other youth, uh, it's just a part of their victimization as well. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And since we are bridging the two topics of normalcy and trafficking, Maggie, can you talk a little bit about the importance of prevention, um, especially as it relates to normalcy? Well, for the correlation between normalcy and um, sex trafficking that comes to mind is the whole issue around the lack of normalcy mm -hmm. and how that can, is likely to lead to or in, and can increase the likelihood of sex trafficking. 
that you, that youth, specifically youth who are in foster care, need the opportunities to experience those normal activities of growing up, those new, normal experiences. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, you find is that children and youth who are in the foster care system have a tendency to be isolated and not be allowed to participate in what we all know are those normal growing up opportunities, whether it's having social activities, it's participating in after school activities, sports, driver's license, things like that. And what it allows the youth to do is to experience things in a, in a safe environment mm -hmm. where they're out there learning how to make decisions, how to take risks. The inability to not do those things and have the opportunity to develop those skills, they're, they're sorely then unprepared for the world and going into the, to the world as an adult. I can tell you, I, have sp I spoke to a, a young lady once several years ago who um, was in the foster care system who left on her 18th birthday despite being very, very close to graduating high school and had a really healthy path in front of her, so we thought. And she just walked away from the foster care system. And you know, years later, I had the opportunity to talk to her and I asked why she left. And she said, because I wanted a normal life. I wanted to have a date. I was 18 and never had a chance for a date. And it's that isolation that I think can put youth at risk um, of going out into the world too soon, running away from the system, and being unprepared for what they're about to face. That then puts them in a very um, dangerous, unhealthy environment, and they, they aren't in it in an ability to have the skills to make good decisions. Mm -hmm. So a part of, um, part of prevention, mm -hmm. a part of the correlation between um, normalcy and sex trafficking is around giving children and youth the opportunity to develop the skills they need in a safe place, like most children do and should, so they're prepared for the world ahead of them and they don't make unsafe, dangerous decisions. Great, thank you. And I do want to give the panel an opportunity to talk about some of the resources that they have from their um, offices. So Lauren, if you want to talk about some of the resources from OTIP. Yeah, um, along with the services mentioned in relation to foreign national minors, um, OTIP also supports the Trafficking Victim Assistance Program, or TVAP, um, which was created to cover gaps where there was not funding available to work with foreign national victims of trafficking. So if you're working with a foreign national victim of trafficking, whether it's an adult or a child, you can contact the National Human Trafficking Resource Center, or the NHTRC, at 1-888-3737-888, and they can help to connect the victim to service providers anywhere in the United States. Um, also, you can access our website for free resources from the Look Beneath the Surface campaign, um, which consists of po posters, brochures, stickers, and cards that are designed for social service providers that may come into contact with victims. And finally, we really want youth to take advantage of these resources and materials and want to innovate ways to more effectively reach youth. So if you have any ideas for how these resources can be more effective, please contact, contact us at childtrafficking at acf.hhs.gov. Great, thanks yeah. Lauren. Anna? Sure, I, I have a few uh, resources I would like to share, but I think there is, there's two that are very important. Um, that I would like to share with everyone, and one is the um, National Korean House on Youth and Families, or also called NISV, uh, is www.nisv.gov, and then through them we provide, it's like a newsletter kind of uh, for FISV, and through them we provide the latest information, best practices, innovative collaboration, what our grantees are doing in collaboration at the local level. We also provide research, research that uh, people can learn a little bit more about how to improve uh, the quality of care and services through uh, for all the programs that we run in FISB. Also, another great resource that we have is uh, the National Runaway Safe Line and his uh, prevention uh, runaway curriculum called Let's Talk. And so you know, you are you aren't familiar with this uh, curriculum. It's a free, evidence-based resource. They provide really um, uh, the skills that we were talking about to provide normalcy, to provide uh, life skill for youth to kind of uh, build those skills uh, and life skill and to avoid situation before running away. So we use it as a prevention resource uh, to not only run, of course, running away is the first is the first goal, but also in the long term, when we avoid situation of running away, probably we will also prevent uh, sex trafficking. So you can find uh, Let's Talk Curriculum is a free resource. You can also find it in English and Spanish, and the National Runaway Safe Line provide um, 
provides technical support for the implementation of this uh, curriculum. And you can go to 1-800-runaway.org uh, so you can download it. So. Great. Thank you. And from the Children's per Bureau's perspective, again, our Child Welfare Information Gateway, you can find many resources if you go to childwelfare.gov. And Maggie, any resources from the Center for States? Yes, and again, I don't want to be repetitive. I mentioned several of them in our opening, the webinar, the learning experiences, but we also have an exhibit booth where all our resources will be listed and available. Great. All right, so it looks like we have time for maybe one or two questions. Let's see what has come in. All right, so it looks like we have one question around the collaborative efforts and how they can have an impact on those that are identified as being trafficked. Uh, Anna or Lauren? Sure, I think collaboration is, is a, a big piece of um, increasing uh, prevention and identification because really we're working, sometimes we don't realize we're working with the same youth, uh, the runaway home, the youth, the child welfare, the criminal justice system. So I think collaboration is a big piece and I really wanted to answer that question through uh, an example that we have at the uh, county of Multnomah in Oregon, mm -hmm. which has been working very closely with Janice, uh, which is one of the runaway home the youth programs uh, with uh, youth who are victim of uh, human trafficking, sex and labor. And when I was putting these um, answers or, or trying to find out about um, best practices in collaboration, I asked them, so what made this collaboration great? And I think the answer from, from, from then was, well, because um, through Janus, uh, uh, we are bringing youth, and we know that these places are welcoming youth. They are providing peer-to-peer -peer, uh, activities, and also they feel they, like a family. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is the main goal when you are working with youth who are victims of sex trafficking, to bring normalcy uh, so they can feel, because normalcy probably in runaway home the youth uh, we use a different term, we call it a client or youth engagement, mm -hmm. but I think it's the same goal. Mm -hmm. So to do uh, and to uh, include normalcy, I think collaboration mm -hmm. is a key because we cannot do anything by just by ourselves. We need to ask for help and to bring these kids and integrate these kids in, back into a community like they deserve. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Thank you. And I do want to remind the audience that we are going, the panelists will be available after the session to answer any other questions. But I do want to move on and I want to thank our panel members for being here. But I also want to invite Jenny Wood, who is the Chief Deputy in the Office of the Commissioner of ACYF, and she will provide some remarks. Uh, the Commissioner, Rafael Lopez, wished that he could be here, but he had an um, an unexpected travel delay, so he's unable to come, but we thank Jenny for speaking on his behalf. Thank you, Rosie, and thanks to our wonderful panel this morning, and it's so exciting to have everyone here today for this very exciting first ever Child Welfare Virtual Expo, focused primarily on the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act. We are uh, very thrilled uh, to test out this new form of innovation and bring people together today through uh, the videos, the virtual booths where you can find uh, printed and uh, hard copy resources, as well as through the networking opportunities through this innovative experience. Through my work uh, with ACYF and the Commissioner's Office, we've seen time and time again that through our travels across the country and through speaking with young people and families, that we know we can all do better to protect young people, to ensure that they're able to experience normal activities like their peers. We also know, uh, however, that many young people in foster care have very negative experiences and outcomes after they leave care. Just to sort of name a few so that we're all grounded in the data, we know that uh, from various jurisdictions that have reported into us that between 65 and 85 percent of the young people who experience sex trafficking have been foster youth at some point in time in their lives. This is absolutely unacceptable and really heartbreaking. We also know through our National Youth and Transition Database that the outcomes of young people after they age out of foster care often can be dismal as well. In fact, 20 to 30 35% of young people before the age of 26 
uh, may experience homelessness. And almost two thirds of the young men who ex exit from homelessness, or ex I'm sorry, exit from foster care and age out of foster care, two thirds, 66 percent, end up incarcerated in jail or in prison before the age of 26. Now, these statistics are quite alarming, and many of us, of course, who work in child welfare have heard these, these stories and uh, seen this firsthand. We also know that we are working across the country to help reverse these trends, and that there is a lot more that we can and will do together. Today, we will hear many uh, instances and best practices from jurisdictions across the country and from our panels and the experts that we have convened. We also know uh, that the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act provides us with an opportunity to really dig deep and figure out how can we do better? What are the things that we need to be doing differently? What should we try? What should we not try? Because we know from various other jurisdictions that have been doing this work and have been experimenting already that that doesn't lead to better outcomes for young people. So, of course, today's expo, as you know, are focused on three primary goals. Uh, the first being, how can we eradicate sex trafficking among particularly the foster youth population? How can we ensure normalcy to, to make sure that our young people have the opportunities that their peers do, to participate in sports, to spend the night at their friend's house, and uh, to develop into healthy and prosperous adults who are giving back to their communities? And we are obviously continuing our commitment and focused in today's session in improving permanency outcomes for the youth in care. We have uh, nearly 1,000 people uh, who have registered for today's activities, and uh, we, we hope uh, that this is not just, and we know that this won't be, just a one-time event. We are committed to continuing uh, this effort. This is not isolated. We will, as you've heard from our panelists, uh, this is just one piece of a comprehensive strategy, again, to eradicate sex trafficking and ensure that foster youth and families uh, continue, continue to heal and that the well-being outcomes are enhanced across the country. Also, uh, Commissioner Lopez and myself and other colleagues across HHS are working uh, collaboratively collaboratively with our partners on the Hill as we speak to not only look at the opportunities here with the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act, but look at additional reforms to ensure that we have more resources for permanency and to ensure that we have uh, the right types of placement settings for young people and more young people are placed in family-based settings. So we continue to work on those efforts as we speak on Capitol Hill and we look forward to continuing to partner with you all to expand those efforts and potentially pass even new legislation this year as well. Thank you so much for your participation today and your time. We really look forward to a wonderful experience throughout the day. Commissioner Lopez will be joining us uh, to close out this wonderful expo and uh, give some remarks at 5.45 or approximately 5.45 this afternoon. I would be remiss if I didn't thank our fabulous partners here today. Of course, the Capacity Building Center for States in collaboration with the Capacity Building Center for Tribes and Courts. We are so pleased to be co-hosting this event today and I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Rosie. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jenny. And we are now at the end of our first session. So as you exit the session, we encourage you to take a few minutes to complete the evaluation. And following the evaluation, you will have access to the networking lounge where you can chat with the panelists and you can also chat with other participants. The, um, you also have time to complete your profile and become familiar with the virtual platform. So the next session titled Opening the Door, Frameworks and Strategies to Develop and Implement Successful trauma-informed programs to address child and youth sex trafficking will start at 11 a.m. Eastern time, so in about 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you.